Francisco, California. Welcome to the annual spring symposium of the graduate program in visual and critical studies called VCS for short. VCS is in the Humanities and Sciences Division at California College of the Arts. My name is Jacqueline Francis and I'm the chair of the program. I describe myself for those who might be experiencing this presentation by hearing it. I'm a black woman with brown hair, um, brown skin and freckles, and I'm in an auditorium with um, a screen to my left and a black backdrop behind me. And we're all here today, at least about 40 of us, to hear these presentations. Uh, by way of acknowledgement, I must state that the campuses of California College of the Art here in San Francisco and the historical campus in Oakland are located within the occupied territories of traditional and unceded Ohlone lands, known as Chechenyo and Rangwetush. Ohlone peoples have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and the history of violence inflicted <coughs> upon indigenous peoples in California and in the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and cultures. CCA has a responsibility to oppose all forms of individual and institutionalized racism toward all people, but especially toward indigenous peoples within the arts, fields in which discrimination has occurred through the omission and the silencing of indigenous voices. CCA is committed to the inherent academic and creative activism required to foster a culture that acknowledges these harms, show empathy and care, and demonstrate positive steps to reconciliation and repair. Today, VCS holds its annual Spring Symposium. It's a great day for our program. It is a culminating public event for our emerging scholars in the VCS class of 2023. Wendy Mareva, Clover Collins, Alexander Ante Wong, and Liz G. This year's VCS Symposium is an invitational, and we're pleased to be joined by two graduate students from San Jose State University's Department of Art History and Visual Culture, Matthew Skordal and Vicki M. Sims. Before we move to the presentations, allow me to say a bit more about the VCS program and to thank those who support it. The VCS Master of Arts program is a two-year program for students who are interested in earning a second terminal master's degree in writing, fine arts, or curatorial practice at CCA, there is the option of a three-year program. Working with our dynamic faculty, VCS students take seminars in philosophy, art history, and visual culture, and theories of identity, place, and modes of perception. The coursework builds skills in research and advances the strategies of practicing and presenting one's discoveries to audiences. Toward these ends, VCS students complete a 30-page master's thesis. They also write a shorter 2,500-word essay based on the thesis and published in our Sightlands journal. They produce a thesis exhibition poster. And lastly, they present their research publicly at the annual Spring Symposium. In sum, VCS training prepares them for careers in the arts and in the cultural industry at large. VCS thanks the CCA President Stephen Beal, Provost Tammy Ray Carlin, and Dean of the Humanities and Science Division, Tina Takamoto, also known as Titi Takamoto, for their support of our program. I'm also grateful for the support of Mike Rothfeld, Senior Director of Academic Administration and Operations in the Humanities and Sciences Division here at CCA, and for Nick Whittington, the VCS Program Manager. VCS also thanks all of the staff administrators, the facility workers, and public safety officers who help us get our work done across the CCA campus. Last but not least, I thank all of my CCA faculty colleagues, and in particular those who advised this year's graduating cohort. On behalf of the students, I'd like to cite the mentorship of Thomas O. Hawkinson, who helped the class of 2023 create research plans and forge steady researching habits in last summer's thesis research and writing workshop. Master's Project Thesis Directors, Viet Le and Elizabeth Travelslight, supervised the writing of the Master's Theses and the Sightlines Essays during this academic year of 2022-2023. Lastly, faculty advisors for all of these students shared their expertise. 
here at CCA, Marcel Arbel Ariza, Angela Hennessy, and Neil Gunn-Bakker, Bayraktar. At San Jose State University, Anthony Rainsford, Sarah Mills, Ella Maria Diaz, Nicole West, and Molly Hartwitz. Now I want to turn the mic over to Professor Elizabeth Travelslight. As I just mentioned, Elizabeth was one of the thesis directors for this year's BCS graduating students. The thesis directors in the BCS programs are expert critical thinkers and readers, well-versed in visual critical studies broadly. They help the students articulate their ideas and refine their theoretical and methodological approaches to the research problem. They also help the students stay on track and prepare for days like today. Professor Elizabeth Travels Life is so well equipped for this important role in the BCS faculty. An artist with a research background in the history of math, science, and technology, Professor Travels Life earned a BA in mathematics at the University of California at Santa Cruz, an MA in communication at the European Graduate School, and an MFA in digital arts and new media from UC Santa Cruz as well. She's a dedicated educator, having been recognized twice with an outstanding faculty award by the students at the San Francisco Art Institute, our gone but not forgotten peer institution across town. Elizabeth, I'll allow you to come to the podium now. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2023 BCS Spring Symposium. When I accepted the role of thesis project director, I learned that by the spring of their second year, graduate students in visual and critical studies have already completed the exhaustive process of the, producing their master's thesis and shift their attention to the transformation of that work into shorter and more broadly accessible form who's volunteering to read a studies thesis. It's a sign of true love. <laughs> the publication of a short form essay for CCA Sightlines Journal, we have some copies available in the back. Collaboration with a graduate student designer in the development of a thesis poster, and the preparation of a 12 minute public presentation for this symposium. All of this requires students to reconsider the entirety of their research with an expanded sense of audience. What might your work offer to those who are curious about, but not necessarily experts in the field you have been developing? Who do you include, and how do you include them in this process? What is the gift your work has to offer others? These are fundamentally questions of sharing and language and purpose. And these are the questions I have had the honor of exploring with this year's remarkably talented group of BCS graduates. We are all here today for a reason. Though in a time of crisis and large scale unraveling, we might struggle to make those reasons clear. Today I'll suggest that we are here for the depth of intelligence and possibilities of spirit that arise when we show up for each other in the service of learning and resistance. Colonialism, war, genocide, slavery, poverty, racism, transphobia, ecocide. These are not abstractions. They are real, ongoing, physical, material forms of violence, death, and dispossession that can be enacted on us and by us and through us purposefully and inadvertently every day. They are complex and unacceptable harms that, in order to repair them, we must resist and the systems and institutions that perpetuate them. So we organize, and we fight, we dismantle, we repurpose, and we retool from within. We dream, we dance, and we dare to create new visions. At its best, our shared critical engagement with art and visual culture can offer up both sanctuary and artillery, communion and ammunition. We grow both our vulnerability and our courage. 
We remember and invent joyful, brave, healing forms of being and togetherness. And this is the offering made possible by the many terms and examples you'll learn from our presenters today. Examples found on the sidewalks of New York City and under the freeways of San Diego, terms like glitch, camp, scorch, and enchantment invite us to rethink what we see and what we think we know. Please join me in welcoming our guests from San Jose State University, uh, San Jose State University's Department of Art and Art History, Vicki Sims and Matthew Skirdal. Their participation today has added depth and resonance to our program. My thanks to our dedicated chair, Jacqueline Francis, and our steadfast program manager, Nicholas Whittington, for their guidance and support. And my gratitude especially for Wamey, Father Collins, and Alex Wong, and Liz Godby for helping me to reconnect with the pleasures of producing visual critical studies. And last, my appreciation for you, our audience, on this very fine spring day. It is through you and with you that this work continues to live and grow. So thank you for being here with us. And with that, I want to hand things back to Dr. Francis to start our first panel. So today's first panel is representing resistance. Our panelists are Wemi Mareva, Philip Collins, Matthew Skirdal, and Alexander Antewa. Their full biographies are printed in the program. Here I'll preview their presentations and introduce you to them. Wemi Mareva, Philip Collins, is an artist, performer, writer, and cultural critic from San Juan, Puerto Rico. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts and a Bachelor of Arts in Literature degrees from the University of Puerto Rico in 2020. Here at CCA, she is a candidate in two graduate programs, Creative Writing and BCS. The title of her symposium paper is Most Campy, Art, Most Campy Objects Are Urban, Transgression in Milano Antillano's Muñeca. Matthew Skurdal is pursuing an MA in Art History at San Jose State University. He already holds an accounting degree from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He presently works as a Director of Project Management at Oracle, where he assists large telecommunication companies with their finance transformations. The title of his paper is Reading History, the Historical Mural at Chicano Park. Alexander Wong is a writer, drawer, and skater who is a San Francisco Bay native. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics from Whitman College, where he also minored in art history. Here at CCA, Alex is pursuing the MA in BCS. The title of his symposium paper is Transgressive Motion, Glitched Being in Naamira's Night Vision, Read as Never Been. And just a reminder, what we'll do is hold your questions until the last presenter has finished, and then all three panelists will come up. We'll have Q&A for 15 minutes of discussion. And um, if you haven't already, please silence your phones or put them on vibrate. When we will start us off. Everybody. Uh, thank you for attending my presentation titled Most Campy Objects Are Urban Transgression in Viano Antiano's Muñeca. Allow me to set the scene. June 2021. The tarmac burns the soles of our islander feet. We swarm the beaches. Pride Month energizes the humid Puerto Rican breeze, and we are frenetic for the next big musical hit, for the next temazo to sweep our airwaves. Enter non-binary trans femme Puerto Rican artist, Viano Antiano. Syncopated beats rumble and chime. The third beat slurs across the pentagram with an imperfect, sensuous drag. The note quivers. 
as if caught between two noises, as if tripping and stumbling forward. The treble soars on its uncanny, unique structure, and over it all, Viano's rapt flow beckons us. The body responds, breath and heart rate juddering and swaying alongside the rhythms, reoriented and diverted from normative cycles into a wholly queer way of understanding time. We sway together into a feeling. Suddenly, it is summer. Suddenly, we have our anthem. ¿Qué te pasa? Que como eres la bella cara de mente, creo que puedes llegar tarde a tu turno. Y a poner ese culo a calentar, que tengo muchos clientes por atender, atrevida. we were listening to with me, as I feel them bodily. I do not know all of you here today, but I feel myself more aware of you all, listening to the sounds in this hall, seeking out your noises, how we've all come together here. It makes me think of the tools we have at our disposal to create futures that perhaps are less about difference and are more about bridging the distances between us. Distance. For distance, all it takes is stepping across it. To step across. There is another word for this. When we transgress, from the Latin verb transgredi, meaning to step across, we are already mired in the sight of potentiality. The moment of translation across space is the transgression of space. Trans from Latin as prefix meaning across, beyond, through, on the other side of. Grali, to walk, step, go, or even to wander amongst the bodies that surround you through them, as them. On the dance floor, listening queerly, I am trans because I am already beside myself, euphoric and undone beyond the boundaries of myself. Transgression allows us access to a state of anticipation for what is beyond, for what is an ambiguous horizon. 
So who is this transgressor I have gravitated toward and spent the past year in some examining? Viano Antiano rose to prominence in the local Puerto Rican urban music scene in 2018. As of 2023, her discography consists of one album and 18 singles. Her music has been described as having the powerful and aggressive rhythmic attributes of rap, trap, reggaeton, and electronica. Most of her collaborations have been with fellow queer female artists like Ana Macho, Tokisha, Young Miko, or Pao Pao. Despite being an emerging artist in the urban scene, Viano has been making large strides forward toward infusing the genre with a queer sensibility. Her work operates as a polyvalent expressive practice that transgresses the sonic, visual, and social traditions of the urban Puerto Rican musical scene through campiness, friction, and blatant sexuality. Her creative practice is an enactment of queer optimism, joy, and revelry in the face of ongoing grief and violence. There it is again, that word, transgression. And here I am obsessing over it. But for rap, words are everything. Rap uses words as a slantwise tool to convey multiple meanings in a single verse. But it is also a world building tool, opening space and time. Viano and Viano knows this well and sees her own artistry as part of a tradition of activism. Underground music, now including rap, reggaeton, and trap, is the avenue through which socially disenfranchised artists are able to speak truth to their experiences and insert their subjectivities into a broader, often hostile site of cultural discourse. In the case of her 2021 single, Muñeca, Viano uses rap to center the experiences and aesthetics of trans femme people. Another word, muñeca, doll. Doll as in particularly beautiful, effeminate trans woman. Muñeca in the Caribbean and Latin American context as indicative of a certain level of passability within cis-heterosexual standards of femininity. In Spanish, the term carries an additional connotation associated with sex work. Through the reclamation of this term, naming folds itself into a variety of mobilization and agency strategies regarding identity. By challenging the image and idea of the muñeca, Viano addresses the imaginaries that exist in Puerto Rican society regarding trans women and folks, while also pointing to the different ways that she, and more broadly, trans women perform labor, including, but not limited to, sex work. Not only does Viano reject any presumptions about what a woman is or is not, what a trans woman is or is not, but she also refuses to be clocked or made legible in any way by the cis-heteronormative public. Refusal, after all, can be joy. See how the chorus activates it time and time again. No soy una chica normal, todos saben que yo soy una muñeca. I am not a normal girl. Everyone knows I'm a doll. Who is todos? Who is everybody? The white public? Fellow musicians? Her muñeca sistren? It is only right that this phrase makes up the bulk of the chorus. It is a heralding call, inviting everyone to join her in reciting the refrain, No soy una chica normal. By framing it as a refusal, 
without establishing any particular parameters for what a muñeca even is, we are already being shown a way forward. And furthermore, this repeated phrase in the chorus is as much of a reiterative strategy as one like Butler's thoughts on gender performativity. Gender, this construction that is not innate, but that becomes affirmed through repetition. Revelry, look at the abundance of visible laughter at the way bodies close in, basking in each other's happiness. Under neoliberal capitalist structures, revelry is a distinct disregard for all hierarchies, conventions, norms, and expectations that attempt to restrain our public sphere. Revelry and artistry are interventions that situate us as more than victims. They are tools that broaden the horizons of narrative, language, and storytelling. They are enactments of knowledge that value joy and exuberance just as much as grief or anger. In this music video, we see revelry made apparent. And this revelry is aesthetically captured through an unapologetically campy sensibility. Even as we're invited into a lyrical world of cheeky play, the music video enhances Viana's project by throwing open the door to her campy world. Once we're inside the store, children's toys and sex toys intermingle on the shelves, glitter and sequins call to the viewer. When Viano steps across this threshold in the music video, we are invited into a speculative world that celebrates the transgressive potential within queer futurity, joy, community, and optimism. This doorway is an invitation into the colorful boudoir where the viewers look over the shoulders of a carousel of customers and meet the smirking, unwavering faces of a cast of trans femme folks behind the counter. This indoor space is a world of desire, gender, and exaggeration. The abundance of playful objects and saturated colors is an instant indicator that we are in Viana's queer world, which is both speculative and referential to the realities that trans women face in the labor market, yet the framework of the whole narrative is decidedly comical. We are invited to laugh at exaggeration and ridiculousness, but the trans women are not the victims of the joke. Instead, we are enthralled and compelled by means of campy aesthetics. We are invited to be delighted. Campiness is a queer sensibility that may offer us strategies of mobilizing queer joy as a political strategy and sensibility. Campiness operates as a perceptive mode. It proposes a comic vision of the world and is an optimistic space where the categories of gender and forms of desire are expanded. In other words, camp's preoccupation with some form of forward drive makes it a sensibility with which we can enter an imaginative practice concerning the future. The nature of camp is actually even evident in the song's musical conceits. Syncopation. This form of musical arrangement that causes disorientation can serve as an aperture into alternative ways of registering and inhabiting the world. The offbeat, the awkward asymmetry of syncopation makes demands of our musical intelligence and formally contributes to the production of new conceptions of space and temporality. 
When we listen to these rhythms, dance to them, rap alongside them, we are perpetually caught in a state of forward drive. Perhaps we are not actively conjuring utopias, but we are interpolated into a feeling that may be conducive to an alternate way of navigating the world. The uniform is one visual way to establish a new form of sociality within the realm of the music video. When Villana is out on the street, she stands out starkly against the bland colors and casual clothes. When she enters the shop, she joins a community of women that are visually equalized. Instead of having a homogenizing effect, the sameness of the uniform imbues all of the employees with equal importance. The camera never once deviates from capturing the joy, play, and care that the women behind the counter offer each other. This strategy contrasts with how male urban artists often dress to stand out from the dancers and performers as well as how these men are frequently spatially estranged from the women backup dancers that serve as ornamental objectified set pieces. Fetish. Desire. This uniform belongs in no one place. It resists classification as much as the muñecas of this video do. There is no way to tell if this uniform belongs to a sexy candy shop worker, a baby doll, a drive-in roller skater, or a maid. There are multiple realms of fantasy beckoned here, and the viewer is made all the more aware of their own biases or reference. The uniforms do not instruct or make assertions about what a positive or productive representation of trans femininity constitutes. Instead, they become fixed as a signal towards historical attempts to reify the appropriate boundaries for the female body. It must be noted that despite formal moves to enfold or invite trans femmes into the music video, Viana and fellow Muñeca collaborator Ana Macho are some of the lightest skinned femmes on screen. Both artists have been vocal about their experiences with poverty and lack of accessibility within the industry, but their proximity to whiteness and what might be considered normative beauty standards may have a role in their burgeoning commercial success. While it is progressive that they have managed to break out into the urban musical scene at all, there remains much to be desired from accessibility within the industry. Just next door to Puerto Rico, in the Dominican Republic, black and queer femmes like La Pajarita La Paul, Shakata Astoa, La Delphi, and artistic trio Mula have been and are still likewise pushing against the exclusionary nature of the scene. It is Additionally unclear if the collaborative message espoused on screen reflects the dynamics during production. The director and producer of the music video may have had a significant sway over its development. One would hope that the behind the scenes ambiance was one of equal collaboration and perhaps even inclusion of emerging queer artists. The whole video is an essay on campiness and queer extravagance, but this still is one key moment where I see all of Viano's commentaries on labor, femininity, ornamentation, and violence come together. This is a spectacle, a shrine to highlight an employee of the month, except employee of the month is transformed through a linguistic play on words celebrating the horniest sex worker of the month. The picture frame sits at an angle 
merely centralized in the frame of the video. This double framing is in itself a move toward the campy, toward the flirtily self-aware. Viano holds a plastic pistol nozzle scant inches from her face. On the table surrounding the picture frame, we see a toy gun, a candle, a trophy, a jar full of phallic paraphernalia, a My Little Pony toy, a glass jar with a stopper, a flower, and a bright red purse with an unfurled fan. Each of these details are so artificial and plastic, again pointing to the visual code of camp and a commentary on the legacy of traditional femininity that lingers in the Puerto Rican imaginary. Resisting a framework of disaster and violence against trans women, Muñeca brings together the women of the past with the ones in the present, the ghosts alongside the living, through the very medium and distribution of a music video or song, the women on screen inhabit a life and sociality beyond their own potential lifespan. Muñeca uses a distinctly queer, hyperfem, coy humor as a strategy to hold all. We are held in all our manifold selves and emotional states all our desires and imaginative capacities, all our intercommunity laughter, dance, and revelry, the pleasures and pains conjoined. When Viana looks at us through the screen, her smirk invites us in. Leave behind all structures that presume to know, control, and subdue us become part of our party. Thank you. Is that, does it roll now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> My name is Matthew. I'm a graduate student at San Jose State University in art history and visual culture. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the historical mural. Uh, many subjects of this work are typical of Chicanx murals of the 1970s in the American Southwest, such as famous heroes from the Mexican Revolutionary War, Cesar Chavez, and Aztec icons. This is a viewpoint of history from the Chicano community in Barrio Logan in 1975. The historical mural is located in Chicano Park. Uh, this park is uh, noted for several reasons. First is that it is a community park that serves the needs of the residents of Barrio Logan. The land where this park was formed is a contested space, meaning that there were protests that were used to force the city to support the creation of the park. One of the purposes of this park is to present both Chicano art and culture. And it's located on land beneath the Coronado Bridge, in other words, highly undesirable land. It uses industrial structures like pylons and freeway ramps to create these murals. The mural that we're looking at today, the historical mural, was originally done in the 1970s, and then along with a series of other murals in Chicano Park was redone in the 2010s, which is the version we see on the right-hand side that I'll be talking about today. The mural itself, um, as well as Chicano Park, identify issues related to identity. Um, basically, it allows people to feel, if you're a Chaconix resident of Barrio Logan, like you are part of the city. It shows people in families, um, as students, and as community members. Here is muralist Mario Torero. We can't think of Chicanos in San Diego without thinking of Chicano Park. It is the main evidence, the open book of our culture, energy, and determination as a people it is one of the proofs of our existence. 
Professor Sandoval adds, Chicano Park is a space of Chicano cultural identity representation. It is a public space created through political struggle and a physical materialization of Chicano imagery. Professor Gisela Latour describes the uniqueness of Chicano Park. Nowhere else had art and community activism worked so closely to contest hegemonic control. Here are some of the muralists that worked on both the original and the revised version. Although they were all independent artists, as a group, we find that they frequently deal with indigenous themes, that they often have influences from Mexican muralists like Diego Rivera or Jose Orozco, and that they are all aware and or were members of the Chicano movement, meaning that they have the incentive to create art of this nature. Who is their audience? The audience, I would suggest, first of all, are the residents of Barrio Logan, that is the Chicanx community. One of the original goals of this park was to allow it to go all the way to the bay, meaning that this, this park is currently landlocked, but it is near the ocean. So the goal is to extend that. The next audience that is frequently uh, looking at this mural would be those who participate in the annual Chicano Days. <laughs> this is an annual celebration for creation of park on May 22nd of each year, the day before the California State Legislature passed a law bringing the park into existence legally. People travel from throughout the American Southwest to participate in these Chicano Days. The next topic that I'd like to talk about with regard to this mural are icons. Professor Jennifer Gonzalez writes, cultural icons are a radical way to counteract assimilation. They provide cultural and regional pride. Icons are frequently used in Chicanx murals. They may feature images that are used during events, like labor strike signs, or depictions of the Brown Berets, who were worn by volunteers who provided safety to the community from police brutality. Sources of icons may be the Chicano movement, but they could also be borrowed from other movements, showing solidarity, like the power fist from the African American community, or Che Guevara, and indicating solidarity with Latin American causes. The mural itself is organized chronologically. It can be divided into three sections, going from the far left to the far right. At the far right, at the beginning of the mural, we find a description of life in the Americas before the invasion by hostile foreign powers like Spain. The center section depicts recent events in Barrio Logan, and then the final section provides a vision of justice for the future and challenges the Chicanx audience to continue to commit for the pursuit of justice. It does all of this by using subjects and styles taken or quoted from Mexican muralists and icons from the Chicano rights movement. Let's talk a little bit about the past. This is the far left section of the mural. It begins with ships coming through a sea of blood to the Americas. They are hostile and bring disease. Huge numbers of natives will die. Their population isn't fully restored for hundreds of years. This is the beginning of colonization. The native population is subjugated as their land is consistently taken from them. However, this same section also contains Aztec imagery. Aztec imagery is considered anti-colonial. It's based upon indigenous culture. Including these elements in the mural provides it with a spiritual dimension. Aztec symbols could include temples in the shapes of pyramids for worship, the Aztec calendar, and Aztec deities. There is a second mural in Chicano Park where the Aztec calendar is the main subject. Murals featuring Aztec imagery could also include references to Native Americans. A small figure stands to the left of this Aztec imagery. He is Father Miguel Hidalgo. Hidalgo was a priest and also military commander who fought on behalf of the natives who were especially poor due to colonization. He was charismatic and drew thousands of peasants to his cause who often fought with simple hand weapons against soldiers who had guns. They actively killed royalists, including prisoners. His troops pillaged to fund this war. And although he was a priest, he felt the injustice justified the response. He is a radical figure who was eventually executed and then beheaded. He is a symbol of strength in the pursuit of justice. And although he did not live to see it, 
Mexico did get its independence from Spain, but within a few decades, the U.S. government will enter our story. President James Polk uh, ran for the presidency on the single issue of territory expansion. He was from Tennessee, and this was a position that was popular in the southern United States. After annexing Texas, a border dispute arose with Mexico for a piece of land between the Los Gatos and Los Nunez rivers. After eight months of guerrilla warfare, both sides wanted the war to end. The Treaty of Guadalupe was signed, and Mexico forfeited over 50% of its territory. This leads to a question. What happens to the people who already lived on this land? Or in our case, even more specifically, what about the people who live in what is now Chicano Park? What we will find is that throughout the 20th century, the city of San Diego, banks, and the federal government and real estate businesses methodically segregated neighborhoods within San Diego. With few other choices, those of mixed race moved into Logan Heights. Then, various federal, state, and local governments destroyed the livability of this neighborhood. In 1957, they rezoned it from residential to mixed use. This allowed extraordinarily large salvage yards to enter the area, often located next to schools and churches. The noise as they destroyed cars is, in the words of one witness, so loud that it shakes the paint off the walls of my house. Three quarters of the population leave the area, even though this is only one of two areas they can live in San Diego. In the 1960s, the city of San Diego, working with the state of California, destroyed over 5,000 homes to build I-5 through this neighborhood, segregating it from Logan Heights. What was one neighborhood becomes two, Logan Heights and now Mario Logan. A witness describes a man knocking on the family door and telling them, you have to move. We're building a road where your house is located. Mario Torres was a student at San Diego City College when he came across a construction crew working on a new California Highway Patrol Station. The land, already transformed by the Coronado Bridge, was supposed to become a park, celebrating Chicano culture and art. If not thou, when, Mr. Torres said to his classmates at the Chicano Studies program at San Diego City College. He gathered them up and headed to the site. Jose Telemontes, an art historian, and also one of the original protesters, describes finding the city's plans to build the highway patrol station. That was the final blow that set the community into a panic. Imagine this. You are told that you can only live in one area. They destroyed the area. They run a freeway through it. They run a bridge through it. They discriminate against you. And then their final act of revenge is that they plan to put a paramilitary zone in the area with 500 C-18 cars coming in and out daily for people who are regularly harassed by police and who often face issues regarding discrimination. The protest lasted for 12 days. Telemontres defines the action to create this park as the moment that the community became empowered and changed its relationship to the broader community of San Diego. As protests led by students gained momentum, local residents came to the space and began planting. We find students, the protesters, the residents of Barrio Logan fighting for this park, all in the center section of the historical mural. This is a depiction of a community fighting for justice. Pancho Villa is a very popular figure and is often featured in Chicano murals. In our case, he, fe he is featured as the largest subject in the largest section of the historical mural. This is in the section called the Vision for the Future. Pancho Villa successfully defied the governments of both Mexico and the United States. He is in an active position in this mural, promoting the idea that we are actively searching for justice. His force extends beyond the picture frame, giving a sense of the infinite. And he ties specifically to Barrio Logan and these people through use of icons. The top icon, which I've circled, is the tripartite uh, flag. It's a symbol of mixed race. 
the brown beret on uh, his head is again the hat that was worn by those who protected Chicano residents during parades and events from police brutality. And then finally, he has a sash on his horse which says, the struggle continues. We can reasonably think of this as a struggle for justice. I believe that Pancho Villa here is talking directly to the audience of this mural, the Chicanx community of Barrio Logan, who has been successful in creating this park and is now urged to continue to fight for justice. So in summary, here are the conclusions. The historical mural tells us the story of Chicano Park and it encourages political activism. To do this, it uses chronological order and icons as devices. Thank you. Disoriented, I could not grasp the glitched video nor the eerie audio. There was a video playing of a figure crawling around on all fours with their face hidden behind long black hair. They were present but fleeting. The footage kept cutting back and forth in time. I wandered around for a place to ground myself. The multiple channels of video kept cutting in and out, overlapping and slipping away from me. Eventually, I surrendered myself to the corner and took a seat on the ground. Echoes of rupture reverberated into the present. The past refused to be kept open. I'm sure we are all familiar with moments of rupture but for so many of us, we are either told to just move on or are forced into the path of linear time. And so I began this project out of a personal need that I had been neglecting for so long. As a child of Chinese and Korean immigrants, I was vaguely aware that my family was here to escape the effects of war and poverty. But still, thousands of miles away from the past, I always felt this weird kind of lingering trauma within us. And during the process of writing my thesis, I began talking to my other Asian and Asian American friends about their families, and what I was hearing sounded so familiar. Stories of eruptions and the silences that would follow. I always thought that my family was an exception, but hearing my peers made me realize that the moments of rupture the yelling, the screaming, and the violence inflicted upon me was perhaps something bigger than my family. So what drew me most to the piece was Mir's commitment to staying with the grief of both the past and present because I am a moment of uncovering my own past in the grief that has stayed with me. Her search to uncover the memories of her great-grandmother and Teresa, Teresa Ha Kyung Cha, a now deceased Korean-American artist, resonated with my own personal journey of trying to recover the memory of my aunt and grandma, who both died early in my life. But just as moments of rupture and the silences that have followed 
have cut me off from my familial connections. Mere search also seemed to have its limits and borders. Yet, there is so much hectic, uncontrollable motion and movements in the video. Bodies move, up, move outside of and next to themselves and within each other to the rhythm of the camera's glitch. Each becomes a multiplicity. And it was all happening at these places of rupture, such as the DMZ, that were enmeshed with my own creative body. It seemed like Mary was giving me a strategy to overcome the challenges for my personal search. And so I argue that night vision, red has never been, utilizes the glitch as an act of transgressive motion to expand our understanding of the self as a multiplicity unbound by national borders, the body, or time. There is so much to talk about when it comes to this piece, but in today's presentation, I will focus on the themes of glitching, motion, and multiplicity embedded within the 20 minute video. But before I go further, I just want to briefly introduce the artist behind the piece, Na Mira. Na is a Korean conceptual artist who spent her early childhood moving around East Asia before eventually coming back to America. To form Night Vision Red Has Never Been, Mira combined and added on to her previous works. She took inspiration from her great-grandmother, a Korean shaman who practiced the religion even when it was outlawed during Japanese occupation, and her uncle who drove across the, de the demilitarized zone, the border that separates North and South Korea, on his motorcycle. She's also a sound artist and used recordings of her voice to provide the soundtrack for this work. This image here is a screenshot from a performance Mira recorded and shared with me. One day while she was in her studio, mysterious voices started to play through her DIY recording amp, which is in this image. Uh, they went away after a couple of days, but then returned after Mira left ritual offerings at the foot of the amp. Once they came back, the voices were audible. The recording amp was somehow picking up the local Los Angeles AM Korean radio station, which is kind of what you heard at the end of the video I played earlier. But in my interview with Mira, she said that she has no experiences in making radios. It seemed that the amp was glitching. Part one, the glitch. A glitch is a rupture. It is electric pulses gone awry, stemming from the Yiddish term glitch, meaning slippery place, and the German word glitchen, meaning to slide or glide. In the case of Nam Mira's video installation, Night Vision Red has never been. The glitch slides around time, reorders the frames of the moving image, and disperses the past into the future. The moving image becomes slippery and ungraspable. The past constantly leaks, flashes, and asserts itself into the present. The glitch transgresses the boundaries of linear time that attempt to cut us off from the past. But what might be the significance of also glitching night vision footage? In this specific case, Mira's use of glitch footage speaks to the historical processes and functions of cameras and lenses when it comes to Korean bodies and experiences. The earliest forms of night vision lenses and infrared technology were developed and deployed by the US military during the Korean War. <coughs> this way of seeing is inextricably connected to her Korean American body. It has its origins in inflicting violence and death upon bodies as a part of military industrial complex of visuality that aims to individuate, categorize, and aestheticize certain bodies as good and others as enemy. Mira's use of the night vision camera, however, departs from this process of displaying to open up a self-expansive visualization of the body. In this still from the video, Mira's dancing body is layered on top of itself. The glitch merges the cells from different moments in time to collapse them in the same frame. 
She is not one, but a multiplicity of selves. Part two, the multiplicity of the glitch. As Judith Butler says, we are from the start, and by virtue of being a bodily being, already given over beyond ourselves, implicated in lives that are not our own. We do not only exist as multiples within the borders of our body. Ourselves are beyond our bodies. We are besides ourselves. In the quote on the screen, Butler is speaking of our sociality in terms of grief. For Mira, the grief partially comes from a life cut short. Teresa Hakyong Cha was a Korean American artist who carved out an aesthetic that Mira now inhabits. But Cha's life came to an end at the age of 31 when she was raped and murdered at the Puck Building in New York City. In this still from the video, we see two white gloves that Mira wears in her performance outside of the Puck Building. On the evening of the murder, Cha was wearing white gloves. And here is a picture of the late artist. So here we can see in the red tinted image a moment from Mira's performance outside of the Puck Building where she's wearing the white gloves. While the red tinted footage plays on the plexiglass screen, the right back screen plays footage of Mira standing in front of a projection of a scene from Teresa Hakyung Cha's unfinished video work, White Sand from Mongolia. It seems as if Mira is merging herself with the self of Cha. The left back screen reads, how do the two selves meet? In merging these visual images, Mir is recognizing her own self and the self within Cha. Though Cha's physical being is no longer with us, the performance recognizes the ways in which she still exists within Mira. And in this way, the work pushes our understanding of the self not as a single entity, but as a multiplicity that can indeed live beyond the boundaries of our physical selves. In transgressing the borders of linear time and enmeshing herself with Cha, Mira reconfigures her relationship with the late artist. Cha becomes more than simply a forgotten artist who is dormant in her absence from our present. She is within Mira and others who have taken inspiration and learned from her. She is always in motion. Thank you. Thank you all for those uh, splendid papers. Um, so we have 15 minutes to talk about the ideas you've offered to us, and we can um, certainly um, take comments and questions from the audience as well. Um, I'm going to prime the pump with some um, questions I thought about. Um, um, when I was thinking about these papers that I've heard before. So um, today's uh, panel um, titled uh, uh, Representing Resistance um, prompts us to think about the ways that um, artists bring transformation um, through resistance. And I wondered if each of you could tell us about why you were drawn to artistic projects that were about making change and taking a stand. Anybody can start. Hello. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question, Jackie. Um, I think. I mean, I laid it out in my presentation, but um, my personal motivation for this project was just trying to like break cycles of trauma and like dealing with trauma with my own family. Um, and so I guess like that's where like my big change is. But on the flip side of that too. I just want to say that um, I'm kind of realizing now that there's also a lot of other things that I can learn from my family and cultural knowledge and ancestral knowledge that I want to preserve 
and so and not change, I guess. Um, but like the biggest moment I think in this project was there's a line in the video where, um, in reference to her great grandmother, Ma writes, "No one even says her name anymore," and I realized that um, I didn't even know the name of my grandmother, who's like my mom's dad, and he never really talks about her. We never really talk about her. Um, I don't know, just for some reason, just like realizing that I didn't even know her name really struck me. Um, so yeah, they, I think that's just like things I want to change. Um, well, I mean, I think from the beginning I've been fascinated with strategies and techniques of resistance because Puerto Rico has a very big culture of protest. <laughs> and um, having been around my mother, she works as a professor at the University of Puerto Rico and the University of Puerto Rico, the student body, is always forming these really massive protests. They will um, occupy the university because it has gates all around it, so they will just block them, and nobody can go in. They will set up camps, and I mean, in my lifetime, there have been strikes that have lasted for six months, and nobody can get in, nobody can study, um, because they want their demands met. And just outside of the university bubble, which is its own dilemma, um, there are these massive street pro protests that happen pretty frequently over issues of military occupation or budget cuts. Um, and it's really inspiring to watch them because they always resemble street festivals. People will go out on the streets with their instruments and start dancing and have these massive sound systems. and. It's, um, and people on stilts, it's like a carnival. It's, it's really amazing. It's flabbergasting. Um, and for me, like, there's always been that draw of knowing that artistry can be combined with protest to make meaningful change. Um, and that art doesn't only exist in this, like, institutional vacuum. It's part of the people. It's part of selling that message. It's part of, you know, creating chants and, and, and sweating under the sun and getting sunburns and um, maybe at the end of the day nothing happens, but you were still in that moment of communal solidarity with this huge community of art. Um, my experience was uh, an accident. Um, I was looking for uh, I was looking for a thesis topic, researching uh, images of the Tree of Life, and I came across a mural in Chicano Park that was dedicated to the Tree of Life. And then I found language that said Chicano Park as one of the biggest collections of murals in the world. So I started looking around and I found a historical mural. Uh, I was initially drawn to it just because it was big and colorful. I liked the picture of Pancho Villa. And as I started researching it, and this is where I really, really became a believer in art, uh, many, many of the issues I was 100% ignorant of, right? I'm a white dude from Colorado. None of this really had hit me, right? Um, and as I read these stories, uh, that all of these things happened in San Diego, and I was suffering from depression at the time, I would cry. I would sit there and cry and cry and cry for all these people I never knew, the things that happened 50 years ago, it radically changed my opinion on a lot of issues. Um, so that was it for me. Do you want to open it up for questions? I certainly have some, and I know the panelists might have some for each other, but if there are questions and comments from the audience, uh, I invite you to offer them. Yes, back. Hi, congratulations. Hi, you can't hear you so well. Hi, yes. So. Uh, Matthew started to answer this question, so I'll offer it to both of you. But um, I was really inspired and compelled by 
I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Wenmi Mareva. Okay, so you spoke about this expansive space of camp that can accommodate joy and delight and resistance to violence. And I'm just curious to hear more from both of you what your affective experience was during your research, uh, because I was really impressed by all of your presentations. And as Matthew suggested, research is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a form of me search and it's an affective space. So uh, I was delighted to hear you talk about joy and delight in your presentation. So I just wanted to hear both of you say a little more about uh, what Matthew started to touch on. Um, this is sort of a continuation on what strikes me so much about Puerto Rican protest. It is that affinity for joy in light conditions that a lot of the times are incredibly difficult. Um, and I think it's always so striking and impressive because Islander life is not easy. <laughs> Um, there's a lot in terms of mismanagement of funds, and then of course there's colonial status with the U.S. and structural issues that become a part of that, but the response is always to lean into joy. And then when I was thinking about what kind of theoretical research I wanted to integrate in my project, there are all of these strains of queer theory that lean into the antisocial and like the um, the pessimistic and um, this idea that if we can never be accepted by them, then let's become a part of them um, and just completely withdraw. Or this focus on grief, which, you know, I, I fully understand because the queer community, we have had to battle all sorts of things in terms of our rights, but also um, where and how we're allowed to live, how we're allowed to present ourselves. And, and, um, and of course, we've had major, major issues and major ruptures between generations because of things like the AIDS crisis. So it's, it's I think, very reasonable that so many theorists lean into um, this antisocial kind of rhetoric. But for me, it's precisely because of that saturation in theoretical literature that I was thinking, okay, well, yes, and. You know, we, we and there are so many queer artists that lean into camp, and their work is really provocative, um, sometimes really astonishing, <laughs> really appalling sometimes uh, towards sensibilities, but ultimately there's something so tongue-in-cheek and I'm really intrigued in that balance between acknowledging all of the difficulties while also at the same time laughing at it. Being able to like, okay, let's, let's laugh at ourselves a little bit because it's necessary. It's a technique for survival. Absolutely. Uh, I think similarly to that, my journey was very like, uh, um, I'm trying to remember the exact fleeting memories I have in my mind and then it hurt a lot and then I've tried to feel it and then I, and then I kind of just go through that cycle like, but in the beginning, um, you used the term research, and I was trying to, like, well, I was coming at this video installation thinking about, like, neo spiritualism or, like, Korean shamanism. Um, but at one point, um, in my first semester with Viet, Professor Viet, um, he mentioned to me that he was like, oh, after reading your draft dialects, like, you know, it's like 20 pages long, and from reading it, I have no idea that you are also Korean or Korean American. Uh, and there was some, yeah, so it was just like something I think I was really quitting because I knew that um, to sit down and really write about these things would bring a lot for 
for me and anyone did it before. Um, and then I think it's a lot due to like the pretty uh, rocky relationship I have with, with like my dad. Um, and so like it was kind of like that relationship kind of prevented me from learning so much about my ancestry and my heritage. But then I think like by leaning into like the research, I realized that I was like, oh wow, Naha is like providing me this home or like this aesthetic home or artistic home for myself, which I didn't have it. Um, and so, yeah, I think like now at the end of the thesis, I feel like I've reached some sort of resolve or resolution. Obviously, you know, it's a process and never really over, but um, yeah, thank you very much. We have about five minutes, so take another one or two questions from the office. Yeah. That's great offline. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the color in all of your work, like what they look pretty, what they're different parts. Um, so maybe the pink and blue that matches your outfit for purposes, <laughs> or Alex, the red and the title, red and the connection. So spirituality along with is it yellow and blue and then for Matthew I thought there's also this fiber that goes all throughout the mural. Yeah I can start out. Um, so like I like briefly explained in the presentation um, infrared technology was first deployed um, by the US military or just in general during the Korean War, and so it has an association, or like historically, I guess it has, for me, it has an association between like surveillance and oppression. But through my research, I learned that red is actually a color that Korean shamans use to ward off evil spirits. Um, and I think Na also knows this, and that's why she has the red has never been. So she's like taking this. Thing, this color, um, and remediating it for us, like reconceptualizing it for us, um, or even just like, not even that, because green chocolate existed before infrared technology. So, um, just reminding us that history is part of our association. <laughs> Um, so the color in murals is sort of, the first version of the mural, the color is a byproduct of the paint they had available, right? So the first version is uh, not very good. <laughs> um, in the second version, um, hmm. honestly, the color, the, the, the color that I noticed most was the Aztec imagery, and then something I didn't talk about, but at the end of the mural, there's a depiction of what's called Azatlan, which is uh, considered the promised land return to the glory of the Aztec years. And what you'll notice in the beginning of the mural, I don't you know in front of me, but you start out with this very blue sky and things get really dark towards the middle, right? Showing the struggle. And then as we come out of that struggle, we see the bright colors again. Um, so I thought that was beautiful. Um, yeah, I definitely drawn to color <laughs> both in my personal style and just whenever I engage with something color has a very high draw for me um, and I think what's so interesting about all of the animals body of work is that it she's very keen on color she's very intelligent about its employment and um, the only way to really realize that is by sitting down with the work and watching it again and again because definitely like I mentioned in my presentation there's this sudden transition like she's outside and you have realistic color so you have like the grid of the street and it's just your normal kind of street corner um, but once you enter the shop, everything changes. There's not 
a single speck of dull color anywhere. It, it's like every single surface. And um, even the objects on the shelves, it just, it, it would take a much longer thesis for me to actually delve into everything that she's playing into because she has like costume masks on the table and, and what does that mean in association with the term muñeca? What does that mean in terms of these constructions of femininity? And, like, and they're all colorful, but they're also all masks that are from traditional Puerto Rican uh, carnival. And it's so interesting to have a pop artist that is clearly within the urban genre in that sort of vernacular of new consumable products, all of these things. And then you have reference to like tradition, even in the music, some of the beats she's using, they're, they're traditional beats. And it's just, I don't know, I find it fascinating. It kind of, my answer kind of went all over the place, but like, I, I just love the way that she's cluing into color through also cluing into different social and cultural reference. Thank you so much for those questions. And I want to invite you to continue to talk with the panelists during the break and during the reception. Um, we'll have a 15 minute break and then we'll have panel two. It is my pleasure to introduce our final presenters for the day. Panel two, The Spirit of Craft, will include research by Vicki Sims and Liz Godby. Vicki Sims has a BA in Domestic Science, formerly known as Home Economics, I think that is so cool, from California State University, Los Angeles, and an MA in Business Administration from Golden Gate University. She is currently a graduate student at San Jose State University seeking an MA in Art History and Visual Culture, where she is researching the social history of found objects of the chosen material and process by African American artists, including Lily Cole. The title of her presentation is Lily Cole, Found Objects, Fine Art. Our second presenter will be Liz Godby. Liz holds a bachelor's degree from Pomona College and is a candidate for a dual MA, MFA degree in fine art and visual critical studies here at CCA. As an artist, they create ceramic sculptures and mixed media works inspired by their surrounding ecosystem and the, and the organic forms and textures found there. Their writing and research include theories of enchantment, ecology, queer theory, and the intersections of settler colonialism and Western science, with consideration for their own ancestry as a person of Western European and Ojibwe descent. The title of their presentation is Envisioning an Enchanted World on Christy Belcour's The Wisdom of the Universe. And with that, I'd like to invite the to the podium. creates art and sculpture from everyday found objects. Cole upcycles found materials into art objects rather than products for everyday usage according to the tradition of upcycling. Cole uses materials and its process merges into an unrelenting commentary on the capitalist construction of a culture based on consumption and wastefulness, while simultaneously creating mediations on its African-American heritage, family history, and spirituality. Cole describes himself as a perceptual engineer rather than an artist. His quest is to change the way we see things, which is an approach to imagining beyond the subtle prescribed conventions of seeing a work of art. 
world challenges conditioned ways of seeing. My first encounter with Cole's art, afterwards I dug deeper and discovered a wide variety of art objects created from the steam art, sculpture, or a vessel of water, scorched imprints that replace brush strokes, each scorch a different commercial brand iron. I began to encounter Cole's art with a different sensibility. Wooly Cole's aesthetic transverse the intersection of material, process, history, consumer culture, obsolescence, and human perception. Wooly Cole's first encounter with bound objects as a material for creating a work of art was the steam art, which is the focus of my presentation. My question, as a perceptual engineer, what aspects of Willie Cole's art and theory transform the visual language of African American art during the first 20 years of the 21st century? My thesis investigates how the aesthetic of an old steam iron is engineered into an art object that transforms ways of seeing past present histories of racial inequality and how these objects found currency in today's canon, art canon. Willie Cole has lived in and around Newark his entire life where he studied art in high school and college in 1967, when Cole was a teenager, he lived in New York, Newark, sorry, and Newark was an industrial neighborhood decimated by the Newark riots, which was triggered by police violence. The riots resulting in deindustrialization, disinvestment, white flight, urban blight, crime, government corruption, and gangs. It was under these circumstances that Willie Cole began to see discards as living remains from a decimated city. He began to collect and store these detritus in his indoor junkyard without knowing they would become materials for his future art. After graduating from art school, Cole worked by day as an illustrator and night as an artist. He loved animals and he used dogs as a, the primary theme for his art. He realized that painting supplies and art supplies cost too much. He decided that he would augment his paintings with words written with a pencil, metal scraps, and nails mounted on the board. He knew that he couldn't compete with current trends in the art market, such as Basquiat and Warhol. He determined that painting was a process that was very limited, limited to drip, mix, and splatter, which did not activate his creative sensibilities. His love changed in 1988 with a residency at the Studio Museum of Harlem. Walking home every day, he saw an old iron plate, sole plate of iron on the street. After the third day, he looked at the sole plate and it looked back at him as, a Dan, as an African Dan mask. He took it home and began to play with his new material for art making. He began to make associations he looked at the iron and thought of domestic labor, labor, servants, the handle, black people, silver, money, wealth. He also noticed the steam irons. They reminded him of ownership, branding, property, servitude, loss of humanity, also beauty and scarification, and tribal identity were laid on his side of the lid. The first work of art Cole made was a sculpture, was sculpture. He disassembled and reassembled 
irons until they became something new. The process of dis disassembling irons wasn't new to him. His mother and grandmother worked as domestics, and when the irons were broken, they asked him to repair them. Here, history and physical and physical characteristics are fueled, have fueled the transformation from a steam iron into American beauty. Consumer culture's obsession with idealized beauty, blonde, white, slim. However, they also make associations with an African Sanufo female figure whose scarifications represent beauty, tribal identity, fertility. Also, surreptitiously, this, this image represents a robot, a robot that rebelled. Why? He was man-made. He was made to work as a slave in factories. The robot revolted against the capitalist hierarchy and enslaved their masters. The scorch. Scorch on canvas. The process of making a scorch on paper is very time consuming and very meditative. An iron is placed on a stove and how long it's placed there depends on the fabric or material that it's going to scorch. The, the material is wet with water, sprinkled with water, and the iron is placed on it. And it remains there until the image reveals itself. Here we can see that one mark that's used several times creates an object of unity. And there are other scorch, uh, sorry, scorch marks that you see. The center is very elusive. Why? It's actually feathers, feathers that represent softness, the softness of, of a cloth, a material after it's iron, which also represents the pain of the scorch, which can be violent. I'll skip this in, in, in the of time. Scorch on wood. Scorch on wood begins with placing the iron sole plate in an outdoor blacksmith forage. It's a very time consuming process. The iron needs to be left inside the, the forage until it turns hot pink, which is the hottest it can be to leave a scorch on wood. Say my name was inspired by a comment made by a New York City writer who said that cold scorches represent various skin tones of African and African American people. That gave Cole a new way of seeing things, and he decided to create a series of memorial sculptures with scorches on wood that represented every victim African-American victim of police violence and racial brutality in the United States since the year 2000. In thinking about this project, Cole thought very carefully. He wanted to create scorched images. However, the memorial, with the memorial, he wanted to determine not that it be for profit, from the profit from the benefit, I'm sorry, profit from the victims of repeated images of actual violence. Rather, create a memorial whose scorched wood resists commodification of a brutalized black body, therefore presenting imagery in the scorch that allowed an encounter with the victims as individuals. The scorch subverts sensationalization of heroic images of violence against black bodies. Here we have Rihanna Taylor. We only want to remember her once, and that's in the news. And George Floyd, who can we forget? So what the artist has done, he has taken a hot arm, or iron, 
and used his body to press it into the wood so that it would scorch and leave an imprint rather than showing an image, for example, of a police with his knee on George's, George Floyd's neck. Cole's materiality process and aesthetics does offer a new way of seeing things. What do you see? Have you seen things that are different? Found objects, labor, scorch, metal, perceptual engineering, change the way we see things. Cole's work is accessible and thought-provoking while engendering an evocative and disquieted energy from found materials. In conclusion, Cole states, all, works, all, all of my work deri derives from play, but what my sense of how to put things together is very primitive. Putting things together is like weaving. Look at Native American weaving patterns. They have different ways of putting things together. Has Cole's art allowed you to see things in a different way? Thank you. Thank you, first of all, my fellow presenters. I'm so amazed and impressed by all your work. And thank you to the rest of you for being here on this beautiful day. So in my project, I argue that contemporary indigenous artwork, like that of Christy Belfour, interrupts colonial ways of looking at the world. Through its visualization of an enchanted, abundant, and interconnected world, the viewer becomes enchanted by the work and tears this out on the gallery wall. I use the term enchantment as a theorizing framework in this project. Enchantment is characterized by a sense of wonder that is located in the body and soul. A wonder that goes beyond theorizing, conceptualizing, or critiquing. To be enchanted is to become spellbound. And quoting from Jane Bennett, to feel a temporary suspension of chronological time and bodily movement. It is a way of approaching a world that reminds one of the marvelous specificity of things. As we are enchanted, we are put under a spell of the world and are reminded that we are inextricably and joyfully bound to nature, physically and spiritually. Christy Belmore. The artist who is the subject of my project is a community organizer, land protector, and advocate for indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. Elport is a Métis or Métis artist with ancestral ties to Manitou Sakhegan. Her ancestry also includes Cree, Mohawk, English, French, and Acadian. Elport has become well known in activist communities as well as in contemporary art world. Perhaps her most well-known and celebrated works are her beadwork-style paintings, seen here displayed in her traveling retrospective exhibition in 2019. In my project, I consider Belfort's decision to translate beadwork into painting. And the painting at the left, The Wisdom of the Universe 2014, is the subject of my project. The beadwork that Belbert emulates is characteristic of Métis communities, so much so that they are referred to as the flower beadwork people by other Native relatives. Pictured here are a contemporary beaded vest on the left and a hundred-year-old octopus bag on the right, 
that Meadward decorates all sorts of regalia, clothing, and accessories. From crayon boards to moccasins to jean jackets. We're talking about how paper patterns are created. Bill Burr explains, you not only have to know how to do beadwork, but you have to know what the plants are saying, and how the plants grow, and how everything is interconnected. You have to spend a lot of time with the plants, learning from the plants, and the earth becomes your teacher. Additionally, Métis elder Rose Richardson explains, Stories and knowledge were beaded or embroidered into clothing and items of everyday use. As our ancestors drew the design, they told the story of the plant. Beauty is not only decorative, but also serves to preserve knowledge of different species and as a mapping of the natural world. So before moving on, I want to take a brief moment to orient my project geographically. As mentioned, Butler is the chief or Métis. The Métis nation developed out of relationships between typically Anishinaabe or Cree people and European, typically French settlers. There's a lot of geographic and cultural overlap between these communities, although they are distinct nations. Now let's talk a bit about Butler's process. First, Belcourt begins her painting process by painting over her black canvas with black paint. Not only does this mirror the black velvet typically used in paintwork, but there's also a deliberate choice to paint over the white canvas, perhaps a rejection of contemporary art's love of the white cube. After laying it dry overnight, she then draws her coral design in pencil traces it and copies it onto the other side so that the piece is symmetrical, which again is typical of beaver patterns. The symmetry also implies a sense of balance and harmony that can be found in a healthy and thriving ecosystem. Then she begins the dotting or painting process. While Belker uses acrylic paint and the end of a brush instead of beads and thread, some aspects of the beaver process are still retained. Perhaps most notably, time. Moreover, like beadwork and other textile mediums, the repetition and aggregation of these marks combine to create a larger piece. Albert's beadwork paintings are composed of thousands and thousands of these individually painted dots. This process takes months of daily work in her home studio, a meditative and ritualistic process. A feature that is characteristic of Belfort's paintings is an aesthetic of abundance, a contrast to a capitalist society that relies on the myth of scarcity to sustain itself. The wisdom of the universe also reminds the viewer of the interconnectedness of all life on this planet. Nearly everything is interconnected in the world of Belfort's painting. Most of the plants and medicine sharing the same roots, branches, and stems. Each being is intricately crafted. Care is given to each tiny bud, thorn, and tendril. Each one distinctly its own marvelous, marvelously specific species. As made clear through choices in shape, number, color, size, and location in the image. Belcourt's painting implicates the viewer in the vibrant ecological systems it depicts. The scale of the work is large, around five by nine feet, and so full of life that the viewer may realize their own involvement in the same living ecosystem. Humans are just another part of nature, and maintaining good relations with all humans is key to environmental harmony. We are all part of the same ecological systems, and we must take responsibility for our place in it, coupled with a nuanced understanding of indigenous land relations. This painting, housed at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, 
exists on Mississauga, National Bay, Adonishani, and Wendell Land. In her art statement, Belfort writes that many of the beings depicted in her painting are not just the forces from around, but also designated as threatened or in danger in the province of Ontario, such as the dwarf big iris and the West Virginia white butterfly picture here on the screen. The representations of the endangered beings in this visual and visions context connect their status as endangered or threatened to the effects of settler colonialism and extractive capitalism. Habitats are in danger and being destroyed through land development, the introduction of invasive species, rampant deforestation, and misguided wildfire suppression efforts, to name a few. Western knowledge traditions that inform settler colonialism and capitalism are characterized by a mechanical worldview. The term disenchantment explains how the supremacy of Western scientific and mechanistic thought has led to the prevalence of the worldview of the West, of a disconnected, compartmentalized, and fully global world, the repercussions of the human spirit and the environment. This over-mechanization has created a notion that one can only understand the natural world from a distance, a sort of isolated and disconnected observer. This disenchantment is visualized in the practice of a tenable illustration. Botany emerged as a field as a result of European colonial projects and exploratory, exploratory voyages around the world in search of new specimens to be collected and turned into profit. This discipline is also centered around classification and taxonomy, systems that attempt to order, name, and differentiate species by visual markers, a feature that has resonance with the development of scientific racism and the creation of categories of race, gender, and sexuality. Moreover, the local names of plants are raised as old knowledge and distracted. <coughs> Compared to the depictions of plant life in Belfort's painting, this depiction, a single ginseng root, appears as lifeless. There is no sense as to how this plant exists in the ground or how it attracts other organisms. The individual plant parts of the plant are all there, but they are dissected, separated, and individualized. While reflecting, while reflecting on her study of botany in college, Robin Wolf is a botany professor and author writes, My natural inclination was to seek, relationship, to seek relationships, to seek the threads that connect the world, to join instead of divide. The science is rigorous in separating the observer from the observed, and the observed from the observed. Due to the size, horizontal orientation, and content, Volker's work seems to be in conversation with the Euro American landscape painting. Volker's work is depicted in two dimensions. On the other hand, in landscape painting, such as Ibn's work by Frederick Edmund Church, the image abides by Cartesian perspectivalism, a way of depicting a world three dimension, three dimensionally through the gaze of the eye. This perspective, to quote Martin Jay, privileges an ahistorical, disinterested, disembodied subject outside of the world it claims only to know from far. A two dimensionality of Elmer's painting is also a flattening or a condensing of time and space. All these plants and animals could exist in a single area, but they may not be present or close together at all times. One would have to look, listen, and feel closely and slowly swings all of these different organisms. Albert's work depicts an enchanted world, a world that refuses to be disenchanted, to be recognized and separated. Our world. Volker states that she intends to quote offer a counterbalance to the overwhelming negative forces of destruction, despair, violence, and death 
to which we are exposed daily. I want to, I want to offer respite for tired eyes and weary minds. Informed by a traditionally indigenous perspective on land, Elkhart's work not only shows us the beauty of the world, but reminds us how to be the world. Thank you. I'm still exploring uh, 
um, his work and the meaning, and I'm always learning something new. That's great. Um, is it, are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. Uh, this uh, uh, sort of correlation or relationship between um, the art and the labor is really very interesting, um, and, and and shows how uh, really uh, develops his concept organically. This uh, so it's not like a, a separate thing. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, and uh, this reminds me of uh, an artist that I come, come to know the work of quite a bit recently, if some of you know her, I'm sure, Betty Saar. Yes. Um, I, I think she's still alive. She was about 100, 100 years old, something like that. Fantastic. But some of the same kind of things uh, uh, occur in her work. Uh, which really speak to me. But um, so I guess my question to you is first of all, congratulations, congratulations to both of you, certainly. I mean, uh, but uh, my question, I guess, is uh, is Willie Cole, um, uh, you know, uh, aware, really conscious of being part of a particular tradition, this kind of folk art tradition? That is steeped in labor, this kind of thing. That I, I think Betty Sarr is also a uh, an example of. Yes, you're you're right. Uh, Betty Sarr and Willie Cole have a, a similar way of working with found objects. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a way of the found objects discovering them. But what they bring to it is they have a personal archive that's filled with education and all the learning from their life. And when they encounter a work of art, all of this comes forward. And um, what, what, <laughs> I've lost your, your major question. Uh, is, <laughs> I got caught. Is, in my is, is really cold. Yeah. Oh, no, is, he aware, oh, absolutely. is he aware of, of his uh, position in this absolutely. tradition? Absolutely. He, he's very aware of it. In fact, um, he makes a point that his art stems from that is his heritage the heritage of, of labor as labor translates or trans goes back to slavery to servants uh servitude and the thing i enjoy about the way he presents labor and domestic work he presents it as a way of building the nation rather than as a type of work that you do because you're not educated. It's not looked down upon, it's honored. And that's one thing I appreciate it. I'm not sure yet, I haven't just determined whether he realizes that in some way, he's also repeating a form of labor okay. that his uh, friend, his, his, his family did. I'm not sure of, of how he sees it, you know, whether he's inside of it or outside of it. I do know that for the first 20 years of his career, he worked solely alone, his hand, and the hours that it took came from him. Later, he started collaborating. So yes, uh, he's aware of the, the, the laborious process and how much time it takes. One of the reasons is because he says he plays. He takes the work to pieces and he plays with the, the, the objects rather than coming to the work with a plan, a mathematic, a, a drawing. So this process takes time because the objects have to reveal to him what they want to be. So. I mean, I think that's such an interesting contrast in a way with Belcourt's process, right? Which to me comes across as very planned. I don't know, is that, um, and I'm curious to also to take your question and to think about how, like what, how would you describe Belcourt's awareness of how she fits into 
you know, these, uh, these, these canons of like folk art, fine art, um, how would you, I don't know, how would you describe the way she situates that? Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking about along the parallels of yeah. walking, um, but you know, domestic labor, mm -hmm. the meditative, mm -hmm. and thinking about, you know, unplanned versus planned. She does sketch it out. She has like a plan for it, but at the same time, this is something that's been built over a long time of observation, of looking, you know, outwards to the planet as well as looking inwards, studying her ancestors' work, connecting to them, also kind of repeating some of the same work that um, maybe some of her ancestors as well. And then as for how she situates herself, I think it's super interesting how her paintings have become so popular and whereas things like her beadwork or other beadwork, other sort of um, craft objects are often so denigrated, treated as less than high art and fine art. Um, just, yeah, I just find that super interesting, but you know, she sees herself as both um, a fine artist, but also you know, proud of Métis woman and a lot of her art also, she involves a lot of her art in her activist practices as well. Um, she created this um, poster series with Isaac Murdoch. Um, you've probably seen some of these posters, like The Water's Life, um, that you've seen a lot in the past few years. She's also been um, on this project that uh, focuses on the and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two spirits. So her identity has made it super important to her. And she kind of is able to hold the crafts, craft side of things and art as the same thing. I think that's something she really pushes for or gets in her work. One thing that I noticed that that is very similar between the two is the labor intensity. How long it takes to make a doll. Uh, so they share that. And another object that you reminded me of is that Willie Cole recently uh, designed a line of products to be sold in museum stores. And I thought about that for a long time when I discovered it. But that's later in his career, now would be next year's product. <laughs> but to make it, to give you an idea, is that during the pandemic, his, his source of income slipped, and he realized that he needed to be more independent. So he decided that he would make objects that spoke to art, Black Art Matters. But to your point about how this is viewed, I'm exploring that right now. So it's very interesting that Bell Court's craft uh, like birth has been not accepted as much. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have time for one audience question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just interested because you both spend so much time with these artists. If there are any epiphanies that you had mm -hmm. while studying them that ended up being ways for you to open up your ways of seeing when you would have it to work. Like I know that you guys are an artist, so you know, studying Belcourt's work <clears throat> maybe allowed you to tap into something different. Um, you, Vicki, you're so focused on how will the pull changes the way we see things. I'm just interested in, like, beyond these artists, there are things that you started incorporating into your lives mm -hmm. uh, based on the research and you know what? That's a great question because I will say that I'm one of those people who's trying to change. <laughs> because before I started studying uh, contemporary art, I was very immersed in Baroque and, you know, um, composition, form, you know, all of those things. And what I discovered is that they're very limiting and very confining. And that I really had. Uh, a really, um, I would use this term, sheltered, <laughs> sheltered view of looking at art. And he has really opened my eyes to see 
art in a different way, and that art is very expansive. And also that his art, to, is, to, for me, has created a, a new iconography, a different way of looking at the black images. You know, it moves away from the stereotype of what we used to and what we expect. And I'm still exploring how that immediately had an impact on the market. And one on one, and I think it was the timing. But for me personally, yes, I'm looking at everything in a different way. I've been reborn. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, kind of at first, I found her work to be kind of reaffirming to how I see the world and how I've kind of grown up looking at all the like tiny flowers, the like little lichens. <laughs> um, I love just being able to notice all the little bugs. Uh, but it's also, you know, opened my eyes a lot of ways to thinking about how nature is also all around us, how, you know, it's not only all these things and animals that you see in you know, nature outside of cities, but you know, it's the trees on the street, it's the roots beneath our feet right now, systems of mycelium, flies inside, like as ourselves, we're all part of nature. And I think her work really enforces that. And also again, the sense of enchantment or awe, wonder that you feel when you see these little creatures or big creatures <laughs> and how powerful that is to really sit in that feeling and you know be still you know focus on kind of what's around and really take in not only sight but also the feeling the body feeling as well as sounds smells touch i think we're really kind of brings that in as well Thank you for that question. Um, well, I think it's time for the next event, which I believe is our alumni award presentation. <laughs> She's an accomplished writer, an arts practitioner, with an impressive list of accolades. However, our cohort, our cohort is drawn to her work because we feel kins kinship with the spirit of it. Her engagement with women of color feminisms, queer of color critique, sexual commerce and performance, art and activism resonates thematically with our own research pursuits. We feel an affinity and a likeness in our interests, in our investments, in resistance, embodiment, and mindfulness. Her continuing work as an academic and as a community member, as an artist and a mentor, compels us to consider the ways we can forge well-rounded lives. It is with great pleasure and excitement that we, the 2023 BCS cohort, dedicate this year's Alumni Award to Otalvaro Orviosa. 
We are so fortunate to count you as part of our BCS community. And without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Fotalgo from USA. absolute pleasure to be back in CCA to accept this award and to have the honor of addressing the graduating class of BCS. Today I'm going to talk to you about how my career has progressed since I finished the program in 2012. I will start with my current book project followed by the research that I did at CCA which served as the foundation for one of my qualifying exams while completing my PhD at Stanford and that was a full length performance production. Finally, I will mention my current work at Stanford as both an educator and an administrator to situate my practice in the field of integrative well-being education with a strong focus on the arts. I begin with a visual analysis from my book, The Rock and Resistance, The Struggle for the Soul of San Francisco, which will be published by UC Press next spring. The book is a queer historiography and ethnography about legendary burlesquers and strippers, many of whom are queer, trans, and or of color. They played a significant role in the LGBT movement, the sex workers' rights movement, and by extension, the history of labor in the United States. Over the last couple of decades, we've witnessed a significant socioeconomic transformation uh, in the city due to the growing tech industry, which led to the death of Bohemia in San Francisco. The project thus preserves the cultural memory and erotic soul of the city from the perspectives of my research participants, many of whom were also artists. With that said, I offer you a reading of one of the featured artworks in the book by Isis Rodriguez, a visual artist currently based in Mexico, who is also a stripper, artist, activist, in 1990s San Francisco. She looks directly at the viewer with a triadic gaze emerging from her eyes, her nipple eyes, and the eyes of the tiger that leaps at us from the space between her legs. The tiger's claws and fangs are prepared for battle. Carrying a gun in one hand and a bitten apple in the other, the sitting warrior woman is also prepared for battle. She wears a bandana that combines the patterns of the American and Puerto Rican flags, perhaps referencing the artist's heritage. Shackles on her ankles and wrists have recently been broken, perhaps due to the force of the tiger within. Indeed, she has the eyes of the unleashed tiger. Her arched bare feet are positioned as though they were still in high heels. The heels are ghosted. The woman could be Latina, given her dark skin, dark hair, and dark eyes. Her triadic gaze is simultaneously diffuse and direct. This causes the viewer to constantly shift their gaze. Which pair of eyes should we focus on? Perhaps this is the same multidimensional embodied gaze that causes spectators to shift their gaze in the midst of erotic performances, such as those in which the artist performed while working as an exotic dancer. When a spectator looks at a dancer, she looks back, not only from her eyes, but from other parts of her body that are being gazed upon. This multidimensional stripper gaze is one of her tools for erotic resistance. It is not only active, but also haptic. The woman's closed lush lips contrast with the open mouth of the tiger beneath her. It bares its fangs and aggressively gestures toward the viewer with its clawed paws. The original painting of this work, titled No More, was included in Isis' solo exhibition, My Life as a Comic Stripper. The show was curated by Yolanda Lopez and opened in 1997 at Galeria de la Raza in San Francisco. 
This reading is an example of a performative visual analysis in the sense that performance study scholars like Jennifer Brody suggest that reading images is essentially a performative act. It is an act of translation. Performative visual analysis also refers to form, literally how I read the image in a more embodied way. I began to experiment with this method at CCA where I was trained in visual analysis. Because of my background as a performance artist, I was inspired to perform these, which is what I did for my graduate symposium presentation. My MA thesis was titled Embodying Spaces, Memory and Resistance in the Aftermath of Argentina's Dirty War from 1976 to 1983. In this project, I examined the visual politics of the disappeared, the visual politics of the disappeared focusing on the collaborations between human rights activists and artists in the aftermath of the Dirty War. This war resulted in tens of thousands of forced disappearance and torture, and was one of several US-backed dictatorships that occurred throughout Latin America in the latter part of the 20th century. My primary inspiration for that work came up from a class that I took with Argentine human rights artist and activist, Claudia Bernardi, who was teaching at BCS at the time, and whose sister is one of the founding members of the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team. They are responsible for exhuming mass graves and identifying human remains. I was also inspired by my other mentors here at CCA, comprised of a fabulous group of artists, scholars, and artist scholars, like Tina Takamoto, Jackie Francis, Julian Carter, Verdana Segeze, Terza Latimer, and Maria McVerish. All of them helped me cultivate my skills as a visual studies scholar and supported my efforts in performative visual analysis. Ultimately, it was my MA thesis that inspired me to apply to PhD programs. After I finished my MA in 2012, I received a grant from the National Association of Latino Art and Culture to de develop my thesis presentation as a performance. I presented this at Galeria de Raza as a work in progress. <clears throat> and finally, to conclude the story of how this project evolved, I decided to work on this material for one of my second year qualifying exams at Stanford in which I staged the full production at the Nidery Theater. So that is how my work at CCA informed my research-based art practice as a PhD student. Another aspect of my work, which has also been informed by my training at CCA, is my teaching. At Stanford, I have a hybrid role in which I teach and I also administer an integrated learning program called LifeWorks. This is a diagram of our pedagogical pillars in which we integrate traditional disciplinary engagement with creative expression and contemplative practice. In LifeWorks, I recruit and mentor other lecturers in developing courses that fit this model, and I also design and teach my own courses. For example, this quarter I'm teaching two courses. I am piloting one of them, which is cross-listed with theater and performance studies called Kinesthetic Delight, Movement and Meditation. And it's what it sounds like. It's a course that teaches students about dynamic forms of meditation because I found over the years that for young people who are just beginning to meditate, it can cause them anxiety to sit still for long periods of time. And so instead, I show them walking meditation, laughter yoga, qigong, and contemplative dance practices. The latter was developed by Barbara Dilley, who was a student of both Merce Cunningham and Shoyang Rupa Rinpoche. He was one of the first to bring Buddhism to the West, and he emphasized the importance of the intersection between creative practice and meditation because he himself was an artist. He also founded Naropa University in Colorado. The other class I'm teaching this quarter is called Art, Meditation, and Creation, and that one is cross-listed with art history. It is a research-based and meditation-centered writing and creative practice course. So this course is a lot of fun because we go to different sites on campus, like special collections and museums and other sites where outdoor sculptures are located. And students have the opportunity to learn how to write in visual analysis in specific locations. So the prompt that I give them is to write from the body, from a more embodied 
uh, awareness. I piloted this class last year and was delighted to see what students came up with. Some of them incorporated devised performance, performances into their presentations. Uh, others came up with embodied interactive activities for their peers to engage their chosen artwork. And others wrote beautiful visual analyses that were integrated with guided meditations. The role of contemplation in engaging art has been taken up by many museums in recent years. For example, in 2021, the Getty sponsored a convening on mindfulness in the museums, and there have been uh, increasing discussions about the role that art can play to support mental health and well-being. And that brings me to the final project I'll share, which is a new LifeWorks initiative called AWE, A-W-E, stands for Art and Well-Being Engagement. The pun is intended here because there has been significant research in psychology and neuroscience about the importance of cultivating awe states to support our well-being. Art, of course, can be a source of awe as well. So we have our first official event coming up in a couple of weeks that I'm very excited about, and you're all invited. <laughs> so come on down to the peninsula. It's called um, Kinesthetic Delight, Playful Mindfulness in the Museums. Uh, I'll post updates on my website and on social media. You can also find info on the Stanford uh, events calendar. I will be managing the event, but I'll open with a short meditation, and then um, after lunch, I'll be facilitating uh, kinesthetic gazing, I Qigong, in which I will integrate I Qigong with a guided meditation in front of an artwork. So to come full circle, this is another way that I have evolved performative visual analysis uh, by integrating a contemplative approach because I'm interested in the intersection of the analytical, the contemplative, and the embodied aspects of perceiving artwork. So that, my friends, is what I've been up to since I graduated. And I am so incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity to think, write, and create with an amazing community uh, comprised of my cohorts and my mentors. And uh, with that said, I thank you once again for this honor and um, for this privilege of addressing the graduating class. And I offer my deepest and warmest congratulations. tells us much about society and about culture, of course. How it's made, who makes it, where it's found, and why it's important. To write about art and culture at any moment is a brave and creative endeavor. All of the students have so skillfully demonstrated why we all appreciate, consume, and need art and visual representation, especially these artworks that powerfully express ideas and concerns and that problematize them. We congratulate them on completing this work despite the challenges they face as citizens, as subjects, as change makers in these truly anxious times. So this is their time. Their research, their writing, their scholarship, their activism, their art making is for now and for the future, and there's so much work to do. Now's the time. Let's celebrate these opportunities and their achievements today. Let's make our way to the courtyard for refreshments and for more conversation. Thank you. Thank you.